Welcome to Tech at Lunch, the podcast that satisfies your hunger for all things tech while you enjoy your midday meal. So grab your sandwich, tune in, and let's dig in. Hello, I'm Nick. Hello, I'm Ed. Hey, I'm John. And, you know, this week we're kind of, you know, moving on, you know, through here. Um, you know, we had a really good, you know, last series on um, uh, preventive maintenance, I think. I think we, we covered a lot of good ground. Um, and this week... We kind of want to start a series on um, consumables and sustainability. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to step through this. We're going to step through what are the different consumables that we have. And then you're going to start looking at your sustainability options. This is for pretty much all levels of, say, additive manufacturing. You're talking from the lower level 3D printer that what, you know some people are running at their house. To the guys that are running ABV and robot arms using pellet extruders yeah. on, the, on the far end of the spectrum, right? So we're going to have it split up into, into different things. Um, so, you know, before we introduce this topic, um, we also want to get into the fact that um, what are y'all thinking when you start hearing, you know, consumables and uh, yeah. um, uh, the sustainability? Well, yeah, I, I'm going to be honest with you. First, before I get into that, go to the website, Printed Heritage. Yeah. Look at it. Check it out. Just see if there's any lithophanes or anything that might interest you. Just wanted to bring that up. Yeah, we'll also do it in Printed Flag soon, too. So we'll yeah. get all right. There's going to be new things on there, and then there's there's going to be new, uh, new. I wouldn't, I don't want to say, like, I don't want to give too much away. Yeah. So there'll be new items on there eventually. You soon. also see some new stuff from Volcanara 3D, some new shirts and stuff like that we're yeah, going to be doing. Yeah. Check all that stuff out. I just wanted to get that out early. So yeah, but sustain uh, sorry, con- uh, consumables and sustainability. So consumables, I mean, to me, it's there's so many things. Anything that you've ever changed, ever changed. Yeah, can eventually it's eventually a consumable. You have consumed the use, the lifetime of that item, piece, tool, whatever it is. Um, so for me, whenever I think about these two things kind of in conjunction, I'm thinking about what am I using? How fast am I using it? Um, supply chain management ends up mm-hmm. popping up that, that rears its ugly head. We don't like talking about it too much. Yeah. It gets convoluted. Business. Yeah. But, but those are things you got to get resources. You got to make the yeah. items you got to be, a, and then you eventually consume them, whether <laughs> it's on an industrial level on um you know a production floor or something like that or the consumer level uh in in your house or your kitchen or back room you know whatever room you have your printer in your farm but at the end of the day the everyone still has to answer the same question Mm -hmm. where do you put it after you're done what do you do with what's left what do i do with what failed what do i do with this other plastic or materials that i haven't or can't use anymore. So in that sense, like, do you just throw it away? Does it go sit in the landfill? These are plastics. Right. Like, Thermoplastics. Is best. that really the best thing for them? I mean, PLA, fine. Yeah, PLA that, will be great. It's biodegradable, but... So is PETG. To it, most of it. Most of it. We got, we got to be careful, because some of the stuff that, that people that we're making now is kind of a PETG blend. Yeah. And it makes it last a lot longer. I mean, that's why you see some of the plastic bottles. They, they, they last a couple yeah, of decades. Yeah. yeah. So the PET, but with the G in there, the, the uh, I think, yeah, glycol is what it is. It definitely changes it a little bit. So, But you just got to be careful. I mean, honestly, I'm not, tell, I'm not telling you to go try this. Go, don't go throw it in your backyard. But, like, these things have to be taken care of. And I, I, I would say that would be, I mean, if you have the end in mind when you start, then you can properly plan for it is, is right. pretty much what I'm getting at. So if you're trying to be sustainable and you're trying to, you know, not just reduce, reuse, uh, recycle, but upcycle some stuff too. Like I'm, I'm using my spools. I'm, I'm printing some um, uh, like drawers or like little open things um, or uh, a cable organizer for it to clip into the spool of plastic so I can reuse that spool. I don't have to throw this plastic one away. Now they make them out of cardboard, so it's more sustainable. So they've answered that problem. Mm-hmm. So, like, I mean, that's just one example. So, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I guess I could toss it over to you too, Ed, because I can go about, I can go over this for hours. It just makes sense to me. Consumables, you're consuming those items, and right. 
sustainably you're trying to make sure you can continue i mean honestly if you're trying to make a profit off it doing it in this industry level you want to be able to consume as long as possible right so Makes you need sense. to make sure your uptime is so it goes into pms all that stuff yeah so i i would say if we talk consumables we, sh we should look at it from uh like say there are multifaceted parts to uh things being consumable things that you didn't consider and things that everybody considers. So, of course, the material is one of the things that's consumable. Um, you also have to take in, the, uh, in the, as a factor, nozzles, um, your hot ends, um, the bed itself, but also time. Time is consumable. Yeah. So, you have to take in that time that you put into producing that part. That's something that's yeah. going to be consumed and if you're talking about doing this as other than uh, a hobbyist type mm -hmm. of thing, you have to keep that in in consideration in the cost of making whatever product. When you figure out how I can recycle saying? time, please let me know. I'm gonna try to do that every day. Upcycle, I want to work. You <laughs> well, just <laughs> yeah. So so let's let's get into just the material. So in material in general, if it's kept at the right temperature, it can last up to twelve to eighteen years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, like they said, it is a biodegradable um, product, uh, corn starch base or tapioca base or sugar cane. Um, but still, you know, uh, if we are putting this stuff in a landfill, it still takes time. Um, um, although it's, it is not UV um, resistant, so it can break down within a week on the UV. Break down meaning it becomes brittle. Yeah, no, that's true. I've actually mm -hmm. I've left something out in my car before. And yeah. It's not melted, but broken after, after yeah. a while. And yeah. It was actually a PLA, yeah. Yeah. And one of the things you have to consider with this particular consumable, like we're saying, material, that's probably the, the one that everybody would be more familiar with, is, like I said, you have to keep it at a certain temperature, and then you also have to consider moisture because moisture will affect the quality of that material and the quality of the material you buy it in the beginning also will be a factor in that consumable. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, we also have the, the you know, the recycled, you know, um, material. However, and we'll, we'll throw a big wrench in the, you know, head over here, you know, we, um, is, you know, this week we want to dig into your nozzles, your Bowden tubes, and also your your bed your bed structures mind you not everybody uses a, a Bowden tube I, we've seen robots that no shit use vacuum tubes okay um yeah the pellet, pellet, <laughs> pellet, pellet tubes, shooters yeah right so they may have they have a different hotter than everybody else does um they have a heating element i think it was um yeah so i mean you get it in a closed container like it can only do but so much and then they just let gravity do the work of right you know uh, making it viscous or hot enough so right. that it, drew, it, it it drops out. I think it makes sense. I mean, because the hot ends, I mean, or not hot ends, but nozzles come in so many variations. Yeah. They're not all made the same. The material. Yeah. I mean, this was something that, like, if we broke it down to, like, how, even when I say, like, when I started printing, they give you the brass nozzle out of the gate. It's the cheapest mm -hmm. nozzle. It's the, um, you know the most the most um sorry the least resistant to abrasion right so what, what what i mean by that is immediately if you get like some type of filament that kind of is a little bit grady or gritty or rough like uh, like sandpaper would feel um then that diameter which if you've got a standard printer like fdm it's 0.4 millimeter is going to quickly become bigger and bigger and bigger right. And then at a certain point, you're going to start noticing on your prints that um, maybe something's not symmetrical like it should have been. The file's not the problem. If you make the file the right way and it still comes out wrong, it is definitely symptoms of settings of your printer. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, honestly, like, I could break it down so many different ways. You start off with a Bowden tube. Um, there's, like, if you, you broke that down, I can, I can break that down, like, deeper is showing the friction just in the tube if that diameter is not correct if you're 
your material, your filament that's going in the tube is not the right diameter. I learned that lesson the hard way because I bought oh, the I wrong one. Two point seven five instead of the one point seven five. Yeah, it did not fit. <laughs> it did not fit. But guess what? I still have that spool Whoopsie. because eventually I'm going to be able to. I'll, I mean, I, it's to me, it's one kilogram. Okay, yeah. it's the same material. I just need to re-spool it. So get a second spool, run it through a hot end, and then technically, yeah, that's what we're doing. It's the same. Yeah, it's, it's the same thing, right? <laughs> no, so you know, there's no need to just toss it out, even no, if I bought the wrong thing. I didn't just complain a little bit, but I mean, there was people with when yeah, it first you just rebuild, you rebuild everything at two point seven five. Yeah, four silver three. <laughs> yeah, it is four ender three. The damn thing's been rebuilt and built fourteen thousand different times. It's not an ender anymore. Pretty much, it's no, done. It's, it's, it's an Amazon. It's the ender only in the <laughs> chassis, like the frame. That's it. It's like, an Amazon. It's, it's you know everything from the Amazon cart. Yeah, it's it's been it's been Frankenstein, um, Franken, Franken, yeah, Frankenstein. Yeah, Frankenstein. Yeah, Frankenstein. We're talking about Christmas here, you know, frankincense and myrrh. Yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so b- before we was talking about, like I said, the the material. And uh, we were talking about the life cycle of that material, shelf life. That shelf life was basically that it was sealed. Now, once you open the seal, you yep. you can still get 15 years, but it has to be kept at 10 to 40 degrees C and definitely out of sunlight. It can no UV exposure because no. that will deteriorate the material fast. Mm-hmm. Uh, but an interesting thing is is that it is. Not soluble, so you can put it in water, but the problem is, is it's not water proof, right. so it will absorb, absorb water. water. And after about, I think, up to 47 days, mm-hmm. it'll uh, just start to deteriorate. And the other thing you have to look at is some microorganisms feed mm. on that material, also, so it could also be broken down that way. Um, so, what why are we talking about um, putting a PLA, you know? in an aquarium or something because there are some people that are using uh, miniatures mm. in uh, aquariums. Mm. Uh, so what am I getting at? So what I'm getting at is, okay, we talked about filament. We talked about the effects of temperatures and conditions can have on filament. Well, what happens after you print something? Mm. How long is that? That's a consumable. After it's printed, it's a life cycle for that also, mm-hmm. depending on where you keep it in the conditions that it's kept in. That's something else you have to uh, keep in mind when you start printing things, say, on your printer. Yeah. Now those become consumable because they can wear and yeah. fail. Now you have to reprint those parts. And to be honest with you, it just even adds more to it, to the difficulty of making it a resin printer if you have a resin mm-hmm. printer because mm-hmm. even though it's less, I'd say, motors moving because it's just one linear actuator just going up and down in most cases, not all cases, but it's still it has a lot of moving parts as well that came pre fabricated pre made for you. So mm-hmm. like with the other, the with the standard SDM or FFF, like you're building it kind of so you can kind of t- tear it down and change those parts. I would I guess it makes it much harder for a resin printer, and but it makes it that much more um, um, uh, advanced of a user at that mm-hmm. point if you're there. Mm-hmm. You're probably st- uh, someone that's that's ready to step in the fuse bed. The um, what is it? The bed. Uh, the laser bed uh, fusion. Laser bed fusion. That's what it is. Powder bed. Powder fusion. bed fusion. Yeah. So what's what's the life cycle on that? Those uh, materials for. Well, the thing is, I mean, is how, how long like is that material? Powders and stuff. No, like no, that not, 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 not the powder bed. I'm saying going back to a resin printer. Oh, what? How long does that material? Well, that really what's oh. the life cycle on it? That's a consumable, right? Yeah, it's a consumable. I'm gonna yeah. be honest with you because, like, I'm doing, I'm printing something now. Yeah. Like, it's, I there is a noticeable difference between, like, so, so I had, I used the the uh, resin to make a statue of a uh, of a comic book character at first, which used a, like about half the resin, and then I, it set for probably three months, mm-hmm. I would say. And I started printing again, but I didn't fill up everything in the vat, so I just used what was on the top portion of it, which was exactly the color I wanted. But as I kept printing with it, it, I, settled. it, it, it settled started. Issue. Yeah, so it started to you yellow. Probably, yeah, you had to shake it first to be able to get the the, 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 exactly. the, 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 the um 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 
the kidney. chemical to say. Exactly. So so that's that was but the problem. But you're also dealing with a toxic chemical at that point. That yeah. you know you really have pigmentation separation mm-hmm. because you're talking about, and this is kind of going to a, a chemistry side of the house, which I know kind of deviates from our our, <laughs> our um, uh, um, you know nozzle and, and bed you know conversation. Um, is you're suspending uh, figment, uh, um, uh, pigmentation, not pigmentation, pigmentation in a slurry. And at some point, I don't think the pigmentation breaks down. I think it's the binding agent inside the, inside the slurry that breaks down that has to be reshook to be able to get that, that, that um, pigmentation from the bottom of the canister to the top of the canister again. Yeah, and all the resins are made different, too. Yeah, exactly. So it, it depends on how much pigmentation you put in the resin. We saw that same thing at, at, at Rapid, where you had little powders you could add to your, your filament to change the color. Right? It's how, how many how many scoops of you know gray do you want, depending on does it go from gray gray to battleship gray to, well, that's now moon dust. Um, it's pretty much black now. <laughs> right, exactly. You can't you know, go anywhere. We put too much. <laughs> um, but, you know, the thing is, is, if you think about it, between resin printing, um, powder bed fusion, the robotic printing, FFF and FDM, if we're talking about you know some of our other prints, um, the one thing they all have in all have in common is the bed. Mm-hmm. Is a bed is a consumable. A bed wears, you know, piece by piece, part by part. Every time you print something on it, it's going to wear. You start talking about um, FFF, FDM, um, powder bed fusion, I wouldn't say so much. Um, and then yeah. you start talking about into your um, uh, pellet extruders, you start dealing with you know nozzle issues, while tubing issues come out through all of them. Because, well, it may be not in your, your resin printer unless you have an auto feeder. Or the yeah. auto fill system that they come in with lately. Yeah, because the form labs have like a tank system that they yeah, kind of like in. a cartridge system. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So if we if we were if we're breaking down and kind of if we're gonna take the focus of, of the bed, there's like so many different angles we could take. I mean, um, we've asked the question before of like the efficiency of heating the bed all at once and. If you have smaller prints, constantly heating the full bed, is that warping my bed? Um, consistency of the bed plate, like is it glass, is it uh, Four one stainless. silicone, yeah. is, it, is it PEI? Like what, what, what are you printing on? However, in some cases, What's like, uh, the, like e- in powder bed fusion, that, that's a one time used. <laughs> yeah. You ain't getting that back. <laughs> but the good thing is, even with powder bed fusion, if you, if you do kind of, oops, you know, and you have you put too much filament or mm. powder down, you just reshake it, which we saw with form labs. You can sand, yeah, you you sand can, it down you, and you, just do you, it you again. drop it back into the bucket, shake it back up, dump in some new one, pour it back in. Um, mm-hmm. So, because that was the big question that I had with them when I sat there and talked to the marketing director, is what do you do about reuse? You just dump it back to a bucket and bring it back? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, well, fair enough. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Simple that. Okay. Yeah. But, you know... It's like he's like, and she said, you know, and the thing is, the big thing about like bedware is what the platform is. Is it a 401 stainless? Is it, you know, what's actually the heat conductor? What you temperature know? are you hitting? Right. What are you printing onto it? Because like PLA, 60 degrees, 70 degrees, 80 degrees Celsius. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't notice a, a much of a change unless you're aggressively heating and cooling it. Mm-hmm. If you're just doing standard printing. Shouldn't yeah, be an issue. And you switch out the beds? Yeah, if you have a bed switch system, then you're freaking golden. The problem is, is if you're trying to keep continuous uptime. Yeah, that becomes a problem. Because if the bed stays hot, mm-hmm. some of these metals yeah, or materials, they, they will start to break down. They can't they can't sustain that. PEI is probably your best bet. Mm-hmm. In a lot of cases, it's treated and has, like, you know, it's coated very well. So, like, you can, you can do that. But I've also not leveled my bed and tried to print and mm. nozzle just took that coating off so yeah I've been there before yeah i'm curious that you know maybe the issue is because it's a dc base 
um, heating yeah. element. It has some arc issues, yeah. That you never have a problem with an iron ever warping. No. No. Our and it, it uses, it doesn't matter, it's a heating element. Right. I'm just saying, one one is using DC because they made it a bench top for a consumer. But if you look in an industrial application, I'm pretty sure they're not using a DC. And if they are, they're using some type of inverter. Yeah, I think about the I think about the thickness. Yeah, it's like a padding yeah. that goes underneath the, yeah. the steel. But I'm saying like maybe the, the the solution is with the beds, the same technology used for an iron because the iron doesn't warp. It heats probably close to or probably higher mm. than most beds, mm -hmm. and it's continuous. Build it into the steel. So I, I think it's mostly. I mean, in my opinion, I think it's mostly the, the thickness of what that bed's made out of. Right. And and like I said, that that may because that piece is a alloy. Yeah. It so it's like, a it's a metal, it's a metal sheet that mm -hmm. go over an alloy, mm -hmm. which is built with a element built into that alloy. That alloy heats up, and then you have a metal jacket, so to so to speak, that's mm -hmm. on top. I think that's just because mm -hmm. uh, the non-stick portion. But yeah. uh, the the bed probably, how many times have you changed the bed? Uh, like itself on the machine? I've like I'm saying like that piece. But just like general the, use. The, the like to, the, 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 heating, the heating bed, I haven't changed. Yeah. But the actual, like the piece, the the print bed that I print onto. Oh, you're three. talking about the, yeah, uh, right. the, uh, the, the PEI or whatever. The PEI sheet, yeah. Okay. So here's the question I have. Those are three. I know that. You can re easily recycle those. But if you use, what, what's the advantages or disadvantages of using glass? Uh, it's about what materials and the, like, so PETG sticks, a little, like, sticks so much to mm. glass. Shatters it. Yeah, that, like, you'll break the glass okay. trying to get it off of there. Um unless you do it while it's heated, right? right. Uh, PEI is flexible, so if I have a print that's like stuck to the whole bed, mm -hmm. I just f bend it on the corners, and the, the, the force from the corners of the bed trying to go back to flat mm -hmm. props that, printer, so, that print off. So it's more of a, uh, this is, it's, it may be a little bit more efficient for uh, recovering the part. Yeah, um, but it, in, in the use if of we're talking the, uh, about efficiency of maintaining heat yeah. though, I would say the, the, the glass bed mm -hmm. radiates a lot of heat, so it's a bit inefficient, no. but it stays probably yeah. more true. Uh, the okay. thing is, is you would also find a glass bed issue. for mm -hmm. all that, I mean, that would sizes. be, in my opinion, how. Yeah. Like, for example, my Voron can't run a glass bed. Yeah. There's no, nothing built for it yet. You can run a mirror. Yeah. Um, well, I guess which I've seen that, but also now they have that, like, like Corian or Corian. It's, not, it's like a, 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 a thermoplastic. That people are using now. Well, um, once once place. again, like the reason I bring this up is because there is already technologies that use induction heating. Yeah, and it is a glass base, that is probably quartz or something. So I guess what I'm getting at is is that maybe the thing that the reason for using, in my opinion, the only advantage of using that sheet is that is I can take it off and put another one on and mm -hmm. it's flexible. Right. Yeah. But far as if you look at your induction oven yeah if you want to i mean I, heat wise I agree with you that. you yeah. see i don't know what well, what that material is here's the thing that brings us to the another fun hot end is the one that we saw at rapid where it does where you don't have a heated bed you have induction based hot ends okay right that has the coils around the hot end oh that yeah, heat yeah. Up as it as it as, yeah. it as it lays a layer mm -hmm. and then lays another layer and lays another layer the thing is, is not every printer requires a heated bed. Mm -hmm. So, like the guys that are running the um, pellet-based printers are not running heated beds; they're but, running plywood. So, if we're talking consumer, and we're talking commercial, then we're talking two different things. If we're talking consumer, most consumers are not going to have that type of technology. Well, here, here's the thing about that: you yeah. know, that like that's a, that's yeah. not even a bench top ideal the that's going to happen. Pellet this extruders year. are. But I'm saying you can buy what, pellet extruder. What consumer starting off gonna gonna use? That's that? coming up. I have a feeling. Yeah, I, I, just, I just think that. But that's the thing is, probably is we, something yeah. for somebody that's more commercial. Yes. And the thing is, is you know, our you know the goal, you know, what we want to hit is we would like to hit you know across that spectrum because I think that some stuff that we talk about and your consumer also impacts the stuff in your prosumer in your you know in your in your bigger stuff because there are people that are running heated beds. You know, because they have to. 
um, that could use the induction stuff to, mm. you know, to get there. And then you have the other ones that have their heated coils that are wrapped through the steel. Yeah, which, you know? which like I say, is probably more efficient right. than when you're talking commercial and you're trying to have repeatability. Right. Like, I can tell you the difference between the thickness of the steel, of the 84, um, the stainless steel that's on my Ender 5, my Ender 3, and my Voron are considerably different. The enders are they're thinner. They're going to heat up faster. They're going to get running a lot faster. However, you're not having you're not have a, as big as a as a heating element, you know, for them like what I have on my on my mm-hmm. boron. Then you start getting into your prosumer bigger guys, you know, um, like the ones kind of coming out of Prusa that have the multi the multi location heaters, you know, that are turned on based on on their stuff. Yeah. And then you have the stuff, the guys that are running, um, you know, the, the pellet extruders and your FDM type of stuff that are running suction-based mm. print, um, print beds, which are disposable, by the way. And then also running just plywood, you know, um, because the, the, the hot end and the nozzle itself generate enough heat to generate that suction mm. that's required. So, and, you know, and the thing is, is all the beds are, you know, consumable at that point. However, all the beds are also very recyclable. Because the thing is, is once you start breaking down steel and metal and you start melting that stuff down, those coatings come right off, you scrape them off promptly and pour it out of them. Yeah. You know, and, you know, you just don't have to really spring steel is a whole different story. You just roll that shit out and spring steel, stamp away. You know, and then the guys running plywood, you know, well, go down to Lowe's. Um... Yeah, like, like I said, it, it, the only reason I, 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 I can't wait to be that guy's cheaper. <laughs> the, the only reason I, I went down that road because we, we, if we're talking consumable, probably the, the thing that's probably going to be the biggest consumable outside of filament is your nozzles. It's going to be the nozzles, and that just depends on the material. And the thing is, is that kind of segues us. I know you know we, we may go a little long tonight, which I have a feeling we're going to. Is I think that segues us because I think we've hit the the nail kind of you know pretty dead nuts on the bed topic the only thing that is is your bed on your um resin fern it's pei it's pei is it replaceable mm-hmm. okay well is it two-sided is it two-sided or is yeah. that oh you got the magnetic it wasn't one? at first though oh, okay i had to apply a magnetic bed to it but there's no heating on it so it was just a 3m tape Okay. But that's the magnet but and it's PEI. There is one level. that you can get that is you can flip sides, right? Is yeah, no, it's it's both yeah. sides. It's not it doesn't it's so it's PEI it's double sided. It doesn't matter oh, okay. which side you use. Um it it's the same coating on the outside. Like there's no heat, it's just uh four hundred and fifty nanometer UV light. That's all. Okay. So oh, this is the uh the resin fern. Resin fern. Resin fern. Resin fern. So, so do you have like a is it a um, textured and a smooth, or is it no, just smooth both? I mean, you can get textured and smooth, but I just got both smooth because right. I don't. I mean, depends on what you're printing with, but for me, I just wanted something that I could re- that I can remove, and there was a quick two pack there that was cheap. So, so I mean, actually, yeah, that's probably that probably lasts a lot longer than your printer, your other ones do on your on your on your yeah, Andrew. Yeah, so it's would, cheaper yeah. than buying a second. It, yeah. it's cheaper than buying because at first I unscrew the whole bed off. Yeah, and then I'd have to. Put that whole thing into the cure tank or chip off or sorry peel off the print now i take the bed off i flex it it pops off falls in the tank put the bed back on and i'm done in printing again and i have two of them because i got the two packs so mm-hmm. i can actually pull that off put the clean one on and hit mm-hmm. print again and while i'm cleaning now and curing i don't have to even look at it anymore so is the uv light itself Considered a consumable. I would say the because LCD it has screen a, that's displaying yeah, the, LCD the light. Screen is. Okay, so, so yeah, what, so whatever's ultra. making the light at Very some point, consumable. some point mm-hmm. it will Definitely. either 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 it will degrade mm-hmm. far as luminance, or it will fail at some point. I can almost guarantee if it fails, it's cheaper to buy a new printer than it is to replace the 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 the, 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 photo, the photo Yeah, but I mean, but yeah. I mean, but it, it is a, it would be almost like the bed. It is a consumable Oh, yeah, definitely. Somewhere down the road, you may... It could be considered part of the bed, I guess. I would, I would say, I would say, like, the vat, the bed, all that system is all, I would consider it all part of the bed yeah. system. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, 
what I notice the most breaking of those screens are is when someone like let's say had a failed print but didn't clear their didn't clear the vat and so they can't see that there's like things sitting there and when your print bed comes down it flattens and it goes to where zero is and like we all know when you tell a machine to go to zero and something there is breakable in front of the zero it's going to break that and get to zero mm. so usually you see whatever those those things that were sitting at the bottom of the tank pushed through the bed and pushed into the okay. LCD, LCD screen. screen and that's where it breaks so that's you know that's why they give you the mm -hmm. extra little um, uh, kind of plastic chisel so that you can skim through just to be safe mm -hmm. before okay. so i mean honestly that's something that most people should be I, I've for. seen some where you can get like what you have on your cell phone, your little you know, screen protector. Yeah. That goes on the L C D. They they recommend it. They the, recommend getting the, a screen protector like temper glass like that. The only issue is is does it disturb the image? Uh, I I haven't noticed any difference. Okay. I put a temper glass as soon as I got it, I bought one of those and put a temper glass pr screen protector on it too. The biggest difference is I had to relevel my Z my Z zero. Mm -hmm. Um and it kind of pushes against the, the vat of the, the um, um, resin a little bit, but not enough to puncture. So it's And it's been like, well, almost a year at this point, yeah. and it hasn't punctured for that reason. Yeah. I've punctured vats for other reasons, <laughs> which is why I consider it a consumable, because yeah. it just takes trying to get something printed off there. Yeah, the, so, the entire thing is gone at that point. Yep. You, can't, you can't replace that. Yeah, no, you can't. It's, yeah. There's no, it's no easy way. you got to buy more. <laughs> right. And, you know, the thing is, I think that kind of segues us right into the right into the nozzle community. Because nozzles are such an interesting topic. Because you can go from spending $0.10 cents on a nozzle to spending $200 on a nozzle. Let's get that ruby tip. Yep, the ruby tip, the diamond tip. Um, I mean, uh, 100 though, man. They get, they, yeah, it's like 125, I think. Yeah, it's kind of ridiculous. But the thing is, is when you talk, when you actually go in there and you talk to them about it, you look at it, you kind of understand where they're coming from. Um, there is a heat dissipation issue. Um, but oh yeah, that's the one who showed us they had they had the coins that were different materials and, co and the cool bowl of ice. Yeah, and then you would just in the same like hold it in one. I think we got hand. a video of that. We got a photo. Yeah, right? we got a video of that because you can see immediately as soon as it touches it, all the heat is dissipated to the ice and melts it immediately from with the onyx material or the yeah, diamond the, material and with ruby, which is supposed to be so dang, it's supposed to be one of the top materials. It wasn't as quick. So yeah, we, we and, noticed and, and, that. And, and yeah. you can feel it come back into your hands. The diamond tip, yeah, because you could feel the cool, yeah, instead of, uh, or sorry, um, it wouldn't, um, it would dissipate the temperature so much slower it just holds everything, right? right? Instead of, instead of we saw the melt. It was crazy to see. And the thing is, is that, that kind of goes on to the, the, the fact that, you know, yeah, you can buy cheaper nozzles, which no issue there. You're not hearing about any of us complain because we've all done it, still do. Um, but hell, I'm running an old cheapo brass one on the on the boron. But the thing is, you know, if you can spend the money on a on a better nozzle, spend the money on a better a better nozzle. The reason why you'll have to buy less of them because most of those nozzles, and you guys can disagree with me, agree with me. I, you know, we'll see where this goes. Is the better nozzle material will last longer. Mm -hmm. There'll be less stuff you have to put in the landfill, and that's one thing. We there's no one out there right now who is taking old nozzles, breaking them down, melting them down, and turning them into you know brass ingots so we can freaking machine more nozzles out of. You can actually make an entire ecosystem for this replacing nozzles mm. if you're using the brass nozzles. Yeah. And and I would say generally well, stainless steel ones too. Yeah. Technically, clean the plastics out first. Well, <laughs> well they melt it out and you just scrape off top. Yeah. yeah. But generally, like. Most of the times, like three to six months, is what you can expect for from a brass nozzle yeah. if you print once or twice a week. Whereas on the other end of that spectrum, if you use hardened steel, you're talking thousands of hours of yeah, use. I can tell you the last time I changed the nozzle online, I might be too full. Yeah. So, yeah. so like you said, that it depends on the consumer is going to depend on the quality of the nozzle you use, mm -hmm. what what material you decide right. to use. You can use, you know, like I said, there are some advanced materials that can be used that may last any longer, but hardened steel is probably, is 
pretty good. It's the best bang for the buck. Yeah. I mean, that's what I've been using for the longest time. I just recently got a, a mosquito hot end and got the Geradium. the um. I think it's it starts with a G though. Geradium, geranium, come on. No, they yeah, and they have two of them. It's like I don't know if, if I'm thinking of something galvanium or something yeah, weird. Something like that. But um. It's something that they created uh, themselves, I'm pretty sure, and, and this nozzle is not supposed to degrade for much longer than a hardened steel. I haven't tried it as much. I'm trying to mm -hmm. print polycarbonate with it, but we'll see how that goes. Um, but at the end of the day, like, I mean, we've cut, not, not us specifically, but nozzles have been cut straight down the center, and you think about, like, we talk about slope when you're grading a house, you're building a house, um, like, what is acceptable slope for certain things, like there should be an acceptable grade or rate of change of that uh, the cylinder part of the hot the filament going in to the point mm -hmm. instead of it being harsh because what ends up being happening is is if ever you push too hard or extruder pushes and you're and it's slightly clogged you get stuff that pushes back and fills in those crevices and then they don't get pushed out with the rest of the filament so they just burn and burn and then they turn to carbon and that carbon in there eventually ruins your every print and you're wondering mm -hmm. why your prints aren't working is because you're getting you're getting sabotaged right at the before that comes out of the nozzle and and if you're using the the tube like uh, the, the bourbon tube yeah. like we talk about the end of that tube at some point can become hardened oh it will no it will i've, mm -hmm. ha I've had to replace I'd, ha I'd have i've had to remove it from the hot end because the heat creep goes into the to the heat sink that it's sitting in, snip off about a centimeter and reseed it yeah. for it to work. Otherwise, it was all melted plastic. And remember, we've talked about direct feed hot ends before, so mm, it might be time to move yeah. up to a direct feed. Direct feed, dual drive or dual gear. I mean, you, you that would that's You've yeah, it's it would get top rid of most dollar, of your problems. But it's going it's going to remove a lot of those issues. I mean, it was not going to fix your nozzle problem. Right, no, definitely but not. But it it'll fix it'll fix hot end and heat creep problems. We, like you were just talking about the ruby hot ends. If you can afford one of those over the diamond hot end, it's something to look into. It's something to def if you it, you know something if you want to not have to worry about probably buying another hot end for a good shit. Yeah, not the hot end, but another nozzle. No. Buy once, cry once, right? It's buy once, cry once. You probably won't need to buy one for two or three years unless you something drastically goes wrong. Unless you want to buy me one. I'm and, gonna, right. Nobody's you, know, I'm gonna, you know, maybe if, <laughs> if your printer catches on fire and burns the ground, you might need to buy one. Um, but with those, we were, we, were sh we were showing pictures of that, that when they were sliced, I remember, like you said. Yeah. And it's ruby all the way through. It's ruby filling up the void up into the, the chamber. Um, to coat all of that because it helps bring in the uh, heat creep to make sure that you have active, your 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 melt zone is is, is correct. Yeah, and it's, it's not. Like you got to make sure it's not you know getting to any of the. It's not touching anything around it. It's not you know losing any efficiency uh, of its heat anywhere mm -hmm. too because like. I mean that's why we talk about the heat block, is, or, or will talk about the heat block, is because that that also has inefficiencies, which is why you need a sock, which is also a consumable. Which yep. Is, yep. I learned that the hard way. I tried to print my foreign without a sock on it, and it would not let me heat up. Yeah, which isn't isn't it's not. Ex I mean, it, it is a science, but it's not an exact science right now. So right. like, I don't print with a sock on, and my prints come out great. You needed to print with the sock yeah, on. But, it's but about the funny, the situation in the, the environment. Yeah, and the funny part is, is on my Ender Five over here, it does not have a sock on it. Yeah. Um. So I don't need to worry about the consumable on that printer. However, the Voron and its enclosure has to have a sock on it. I was gonna say, well, yeah, yeah. Compare, <laughs> compare the usage rate. Like, Printing the same material. Yeah. So the same material, but like I would prefer to use the Voron more often than not. So right. I would rather this that to be to be the one the main use. This one, if you had it main use without a sock, I have questions about the, the like the not stability, but the um, dur durability of the hot the hot the block that you're constantly heating and cooling. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like at a certain point that that would be a point of failure. That yeah, the, it'll be know, replaced yeah. eventually. Like it's like we said, we'll get into that later. Yeah, you know, it being the Ender Five Pro, it already had the hot end, the the um, all metal hot end on it, um, which yeah. is nice. Which is good if you want to print 
anything besides feeler. Yeah, feeler. <laughs> 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 you can try pet G, but you, like we talk about this again, <laughs> you degrade it the more you use it. It's brass. It, it, it might have, you might have some problems. I mean, there's a reason why you can. I mean, like I brass is just not as durable as some of the right. hardened steels. So that's why we use steel instead of steel for swords instead of brass swords. Mm -hmm. They did that dark. once and it worked out to my favor. Yeah, it didn't last very long, did it? <laughs> yeah. you know, a couple of dents and guess what? It no longer worked anymore. Like, what is this guy making his sword out of? <laughs> Everybody's going and making them out of lead. Yeah. You know, they wonder why they're melting. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the thing is, 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 is nozzles are, are, you know, I think a little bit more interesting to some people be, instead of the bed situation because, and the reason why is one, they're so small, people forget about them. Hmm. They forget to change them. But there's also no one out there, you know, that's actually recycling these things. They're all being thrown in the landfill, you know. And it's if you are recycling them, let us know how you're doing it because I'm kind of curious. Because I was thinking about taking them, burning them out with a blowtorch, and throwing them into a vat and eventually melt them down to an ingot. Um, yeah, just put them in a forge. Exactly. You know, it, it, it's just how it yeah. goes. Give us no, a couple months, we'll you, sell you that ingot. <laughs> yeah, or you can, uh, nine, like nine, I said, nine. if you if you don't want to go through building a uh, forge or doing that, you know, you can actually take those and recycle them. Yeah, you can. Yeah, just well, get, yeah, a, the get a certain thing. amount, and then you can take it to your local recycle center, and those can be put back through being reused. Yeah. If, if you don't, uh, if you're not right. industrious enough to build your own forge and melt them and make ingots. And make your own nozzles. Yeah, that's at least a responsible and thing to do. Well, I mean, that, I mean, I think that's a responsible it. thing to do. Yeah, yeah, is to at least take it, them to the recycler. Well, it's the same thing that we talk. That what do you do with with batteries? Car batteries, like big batteries. You turn them to stuff around. You, you, well, you can you can reuse some of the stuff, but like most people toss them in the trash. You should really recycle them. So, like big batteries, like say car batteries, those you know normally you take those and get a core charge. You know, it is a system for that. Um, fortunately, the, the company uh, we work at, they have a program where you can bring in uh, other type of batteries and they dispose of them. Mm -hmm. But there are ways to do that. So, like I said, it's, it, it takes a little bit of work on your part. I know we're getting off of consumables and uh, talking about recycling. Mm. But, but, I, but I, I think it should, at, at a minimum, we should be responsible enough to take care of the stuff that we generate. Yeah. Right. And the own footprint, yeah. Right. Right. And, you know, the thing is, is, you know, as you move up in the ladder and you start moving from, you know, consumer to prosumer, from prosumer to commercial, um, from commercial to ultra commercial, if you start getting into building things with, you know, cuckoo robots and, you know, pellet feeders, you start getting into all the other bad animals over there. Um, because then, you know, you got pellets showing up in a vat or a tub, you know, now you got to worry about recycling the tub. Um, but, you know, there you start dealing with your tubing. The tubing starts becoming a problem. Like what we talked about with the bowden tubes, it can get hard on one end and it kind of be hard to fill. You know, there, I think with all, the only thing we really saw with the, um, um, the pellet extruders, yes, there is a nozzle, you know, there that's pushing through. Same thing as regular, regular nozzles and they have to, they have to be replaced. Is a lot of times it's an air compress, it's an air, it's an air issue. You know, not putting enough air behind the the, the pellets. Um, and the, I'll tell you this: if you want to try a pellet extruder, there's the DIY pellet extruder online right now that you can go out and download and try to play with it. You know, and build one out yourself if you really want to build one. You can put one on Ender yeah. Three. If you got an old, yeah, no, if you got an old Ender or old printer, yeah. you can re, you can repurpose, upcycle it. Yeah, I'll probably I'll probably take one just to try it. I got a spare one sitting in there, um, just to try it. Maybe we can. Do a video or something like that on a build of a, um, uh, an, of a pellet extruder or something like that, and you know, see how many people we can confuse in ten minutes. Hmm. Um, if not, we'll just confuse ourselves because none of us have used uh, pellet extruders, so that could be a very interesting experience. I mean, YouTube is it. <laughs> YouTube's a YouTube's a thing. Yeah, don't believe everything you hear on the internet, though. Yeah, or you might see us sitting there banging our heads against the table, wondering why it's not working. These are the experts. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You know, we just stayed a holiday in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so one thing we didn't talk about, I don't know how often we use it or don't use it, but mm -hmm. we didn't talk about the uh, 
product we use to clean. Yeah, we're definitely we're definitely gonna go into it. We we have an entire episode I think on on cleaning solvents and products. I think yeah. Because the thing is, and good thing you brought that up, and the reason why we don't want to talk about that, we're talking about bedding, you know, or beds, is because there are some people out there, and this is kind of a very interesting conversation, that there are some people out there who claim you to use acetone, to or acetone to clean your beds, right? However, there, there's the other camp that says use isopropyl alcohol. Some people are also on the camp of, okay, cool, I just want to use a uh, Dawn dish detergent mm-hmm. and a brush to clean my bed. Or, hell, I just want to stick the damn thing in the, in the, in the washing machine. You know, in the dishwasher. Probably a bad idea. I was about to say, not the washing machine. Yeah, don't, <laughs> don't even do that. Bad ideas. It's like when you it's were a kid and you want to wash your shoes, hands. you throw your shoes in the drain. Yeah, don't do that. It doesn't work like that. No, um, so, I mean, it, it's a good point. I've used all the methods, but acetone, acetone. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, it's about breaking. I think I've never put one in my dishwasher yet. But we, but <laughs> we, we can get more into that into the detail about that because I think that if we just kind of just talk about it now, it's, it's you know, Getting we kind of disguised it a little bit. But but at the end of the day, it, it's they are all addressing a main point. And, like, yeah. you know, if you want to talk about or know that point, I mean, you have to listen to that episode. Yeah, <laughs> and, you know, plan your stuff out. It's, you know, that, that's the one thing. I know we're coming close to an end here. And the one thing I want to I want to stress more than anything is plan your prints out, plan your stuff out, plan out how many novels you're going to need, you know, to get through certain projects and stuff like that. Figure out a way to reuse. Um, you know, if you can find somebody who's willing to take your own nozzles but turn them into art or turn them into other novels, you know, talk to those people. If you want to figure out a way of doing it yourself, because I guarantee there's no one holding the market on it right now, is you know, give that a shot. You know, look what you can. Look at how you can also upgrade your equipment to prevent having to use the consumables. You can always upgrade out of the consumable yeah. round. You know, you can you, you pretty much upgrade to a prosumer. You know, that's why you see guys upgrading the mosquito hot ends. That's why you see people upgrading to the um, uh, you know GNU diamond tip um, nozzles and you know and, and stuff one. like that. <laughs> right, exactly. Buy one, try one. You know, um, don't have to worry about it again. But hopefully. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, I think we'll go ahead and end it there. You know, I just want to say thank you. Um, I want to say thank you to every single one of you. Um, last time I looked at it, I saw, you know, I saw some, some good numbers coming through. Because, um, you know, I'm always looking at the the listener numbers and stuff like that. Seeing where some of y'all are from. Um, I guarantee you if we can get a bunch of people from around the world together to go sit around and have conversations in different countries, it'd be kind of fun. You know, let us know what y'all are working on. Yeah, I mean, let us know the country too, because we right, can make exactly. those lithophanes we're talking about, right? Yeah, we're gonna be making some col- some uh, country uh, flag lithophanes, and you know, you definitely find those on uh, you know creditheritage.com. Um, you also see some new stuff coming out on um, uh, Volcanar 3 d uh, dot com for all the merch stuff that we got going on. Um, you know, just have a little bit of fun with it. Um, but you know, we want to you know take the time just to you know make sure that y'all know that we that we listen to you. You know, let us know if you need that you want that you want to hear anything different, um, and you know, spread the word. You know, get much, but let's kind of you know increase a little bit, have a little bit of fun with it, and eventually set some, some, something up so we can all have a conversation. So you know what, I say thank you, and we'll pass over to the other guys. All right. Well, like I said, uh, I'd like to uh, express the same uh, sentiments as uh, Nick. We appreciate all of the uh, support and everybody that listens. Uh, is there anything that you would like to hear in particular? If there was uh, some subjects that you guys would like us to uh, touch on, or if it's uh, maybe you need some advice on some things, or maybe you would like to uh, uh, give us a screenshot or a picture of your setup for your 3D printer. You know, what, what are you using? Enders, Crucis, or do you have something, you know, scratch made? Oh yeah. So also, I echo what these guys say. I'm always very appreciative to have some place to, to kind of talk about, you know, grow um, some of the knowledge and, and awareness around 3D printing and, and technology in general. So um, it's always nice to have that. So um, thank you guys for listening. But uh, please, please, please stay tuned. Uh, we we have you know the Printed Heritage website. There's you know the T-shirts that you guys uh, you, you can take a peek at. Uh, if you've got any ideas or special prints, I've you know. Um, 
we we welcome those. Um, if you've got any questions about how things are done or, or, or you want to deep dive on anything, I mean, we welcome conversations. So reach out to us. I mean, you got all the social medias. You've got um, the, the link tree with the website and all that stuff. Everything leads back to, you know, true home of the website. So um, just make sure you guys take a peek and, and, and stay tuned, guys. So. And the one thing we do want to, I just completely forgot, is you will hear, start hearing a little bit different voices hopefully soon coming on the channel. Um, you know, getting doing some company spotlights with a few people um, that we talked to it, um, uh, um, at Rapid. Um, if you're listening to this, we haven't got you yet. Um, we're sorry, uh, I have some other stuff going on. So, but you know, we definitely will be, we're definitely gonna be in touch here soon, probably next coming weeks. Um, so, you know, we hope to. Uh, you know, to talk to you then. So, all right, y'all, y'all have a good one, and uh, we'll talk to you later. That's all for this episode of Tech at Lunch. Thanks for tuning in and joining us for this tech-filled lunch break. We hope you enjoy the show, and don't forget to subscribe on all channels. And also, you can find us on YouTube under Volcanar Technology Solutions. And join us for our next episode, which gets published every Wednesday at 8 a.m. All right, y'all, have a good one. See you later.